So, uh, welcome everyone to uh, the first lecture in Algorithms for Artificial Intelligence and Natural Language Processing uh, in 4820. My name is Morha Faris and I am a PhD candidate at the Language Technology Group here at the uh, Department of Informatics. I'll be teaching this course uh, together with Stefan Eupen, who is a professor at uh, the same group, Language Technology Group. And so, I first took uh, I, I took this course in 2011, so six years ago, and when I took it, we were uh, only seven students. So seven students took the exam. Last year, I taught this course, and I think we had about 56, 57 students taking the exam, and 80, 81 registered for the course. This year, as of last uh, Friday, we have 89 students. So this tells us something about the g growth of uh, the number of students at the department, but it also tells us something about the subject matter of the course itself, which is artificial intelligence and natural language processing. Uh, these two broad concepts are becoming more or already very trendy, very hot topics for research. So what we will do today is we will have a look at what's, what do we mean by AI, uh, artificial intelligence, natural language processing, uh, and machine learning. So we'll give definitions, uh, talk about some applications, have a historical review of the field, and some ethical questions related to the, uh, uh, to the field of artificial intelligence. Uh, we'll also have a look at uh, a closer look at the an, an outline of the lectures we'll have, what we will learn about, and some practical details, uh, obligatory assignments, uh, communication, etc. So uh, I'd like for this course to be very interactive, sort of two-way. So you can help uh, make this course more interactive, more entertaining. So here is a tweet and a question for you, since we are in the Twitter age, you know. So, uh, Elon Musk of Tesla, SpaceX, uh, tweeted, I've talked to Mark about this. His understanding of the subject is very limited. Mark is Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook, and the subject is artificial intelligence. Uh, and I want to hear what's your understanding of artificial intelligence. What do you think is artificial intelligence? It could be an application, anything you could think of. Just drop some words. Netflix recommendations, yeah, that's very good. Anyone else? Self, self learning cars, yeah, self driving cars, yes. Playing Go, yes. Dialog systems, yes. Siri, yes, Apple Siri. So all of these are applications of artificial intelligence. And if we look at the definitions of artifi artificial intelligence, there are many of them. We're not mainly concerned of these definitions in our course, but we'll just have a quick look at, at uh, what kind of definitions existed over the years. So this, is, this figure is from uh, a book called Artificial Intelligence, A Modern Approach. It's a classic in artificial intelligence. And they group the definitions in four groups, four approaches. The first one is we want the machines to think humanly. In a sense, we want to understand how the human mind works. Uh, we, we analyze how we learn, how we memorize things, and we come up with very well-defined processes and formulations, and we teach, we write it in a computer program. So that's requiring the machine to think like uh, humans, and that's what we call the cognitive approach to artificial intelligence. And then you have acting humanly. It doesn't matter how the machine thinks, as long as it does the things that humans can do. So uh, this will be better explained when we talk about uh, the Turing test, and you will understand what we mean by acting humanly. So we want the machine to be as human as possible in, in the way it acts. Uh, thinking rationally, this is the logic-based approach. We, ha we have uh, our laws of thought. We have. Uh, processes and uh, procedures to reason, so reasoning, uh, argumentation, these are well-defined uh, subjects in logic. So maybe we can follow that approach, which is basically write down the, uh, the rules to think rationally, to, to, to reason and uh, uh, do inference and argument. So all of these uh, rules can be encoded and put in a computer program and applied to think rationally. So that's all. 
also one definition of uh, artificial intelligence or approach to define it. And the last one is to act rationally. So the computers are not doing uh, things as we act them, they, uh, as we ask them, they act. So they are agents and they act uh, rationally based on this. So they want to, what we mean by acting rationally is to achieve the best outcome given uh, the situation the machine is in. So this is in, con uh, in contrast to thinking rationally. In co thinking rationally, we assume that every f everything is fact-based. We, all, all, we know all the facts uh, with confidence. There is no uncertainty. Acting rationally includes this uncertainty aspect. They might still be vague to you, but this is just a, a way to show you that artificial intelligence in many things. And one way to also better understand our definition of artificial intelligence is to look at the history of artificial intelligence. So the notion of artificial intelligence, not the term, goes back to 1950 uh, when Alan Turing, one of the pioneers in, in computing and computer science, uh, proposed or set, wrote the following in an article, I propose to consider the question, can machines think? And then Turing himself in the same article said that thinking is actually a very vague concept. What do we mean by that? So he proposed, the, uh, or he wrote the following, are there imaginable digital computers which would do well in the imitation game? You probably have seen the imitation game film, you know, Alan Turing. And from this statement came the Turing test, which is an imitation game in a way. So you have three participants, A, B, and C, a is a computer, and you have B and C humans. And the goal of the game is for A and B, both of them, to convince C that they are humans. One of them is, of course, a human. A is not a human. So they would communicate in natural language, chatting, or some other way. And if C cannot tell which of these is actually the machine and which one is the computer, then uh, the, we would say that this computer program, this AI program, would have passed the uh, Alan Turing test. And this is what I mean when I say, w or what w the approach of acting humanly is actually uh, is succeeding in, in, uh, in the Turing test. So that's before we have the AI term. And then in 1955, actually, uh, uh, John McCarthy, one of the founding fathers, of course, coined this uh, term of artificial intelligence. So in 1955, he proposed to uh, or wrote a proposal to have this uh, workshop at Dartmouth in 1956. So, in this in this workshop, this is considered one of the also also the founding workshop of artificial intelligence. They, uh, I think, around 10 attendees came to the workshop. Uh, important names like Marvin Minsky, uh, Cloud Shannon, all of these important names in computer science, mathematics, uh, information theory. They came together to discuss the question of uh, can machines think or the intelligent machine. And one of the, st or these are two statements that were proposed at the time. One is AI is the science of and engineering of making intelligent machines. And the other one is, which I think is, is interesting, is every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. That's, that's a bit of an overstretch because we can't actually describe how we, we can't precisely, let me rephrase, precisely describe how we learn uh, or all the all features of intelligence. So, but that's, if we want to put it in this, in these four different approaches, this is the uh, thinking humanly approach. So we want to describe how, learn how uh, humans think and then simulate that in the machine. So, we can go further in the how the field evolved. So there are many milestones, many historical uh, sort of point or turning points, if you want, in the field. I, I'm not old enough to know them. It's just a, a sort of a very quick overview of, of all of these, or most uh, sorry, m some of uh, the things that were happening, the focus of the AI field uh, at different p uh, time points. So. And, and uh, that's already when the field actually emerged as artificial intelligence. The focus was on problem solving, on proving uh, logical and mathematical problems. So here we, we're thinking more like rational uh, thinking. So this logic theorist uh, program is considered one of the first AI programs. It managed to prove 
many uh, mathematical theorems just following rules and applying them in a specific way. So that was one focus. The other focus, for example, in the 60s, you had this simple chatterbots, which are actually now very much in fashion again. But this one is pr really simple. Eliza is, is an extremely simple uh, chatterbot. And uh, I read somewhere that is actually the aim of, chatter, uh, of Eliza was to show how superficial the communication between the machine and the human can be. But some people were actually tricked and were fooled by Eliza, and they thought that it's actually a human-like computer chatting to them, or a human. So it had this, these different modes uh, where you can chat about things. One of them was a psychotherapist. So you can explain your problem to Eliza, and then Eliza will tell you what to do. This, a, 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 a replica of this program, is already is, is, uh, is, uh, is still in Emacs, which is the text editor I'll tell you about later. So you can actually invoke it in Emacs now when, we, when you start using it in our course. And you will get this doctor mode where you can tell the doctor about your problems. Of course, it's, it's simple things. So it will ask you, why did you come to me? And then you say, because I'm sad, because I don't understand 4820, blah, blah, blah. And it will ask you, why don't you understand that? And it's, it's just repeating things that you are saying. But that's one of the things that happened in, in the 60s. And then in the 70s, you had these expert systems or knowledge-based systems, which are, so if we take an example, Mycin, it's, a, it's a, an expert system that uh, was used to diagnose uh, infections. So they brought experts, human experts, and they asked them to write rules for uh, this program. And they wrote 450 rules, and they encoded it in the computer. So that's why it's called knowledge-based system. So we have our knowledge as humans, and we sit down and write it in some uh, domain-specific, uh, for some domain-specific application. So diagnosis of bacterial infection, for example. Very specific, we, don't, we cannot in encode or write down all the knowledge we have. So that was the 70s, and then you have things like, which are still common today, uh, game-playing AI, so game-playing machines, such as Deep Blue, Blue this is the uh, IBM uh, machine that uh, chess playing IBM machine that uh, defeated uh, Kasparov, a former uh, world champion of chess in 1997. And you mentioned Go, Go also. So this is a very specific narrow application of AI, but that's sort of that w this is a defining characteristic of the field. And then feed forward, I think, uh, fast forward until today, I think the, the most interesting example that, at least to me, that shows you how much the field has evolved is uh, what we call open domain machine translation. So Google Translate. Google Translate is open domain. It translates uh, anything. So you just put anything in it, and it will output a translation in some other language. This task of open domain machine translation, a task, uh, an AI problem, was considered out of reach until 2005. That's around the time where Google Translate uh, appeared as a, as, a, as a product, as a service, by Google and other, also there are other translation companies. So in order for you to appreciate this, I'm going to show you these, so you have these three translations. Uh, these are sentences from uh, Gorbachev, resignation letter written originally in Russian. I, I don't think many of you will read Russian, so I, didn't, I don't have the original. But I have these three translations. I'll give you two, one minute to read them and tell me which ones are sort of, which ones are you think might be machine translated, which ones are not, and which, which one is the best one. Just one minute. Take one, can you see them? Is it, can you read? Yeah. So, uh, uh, are you done? 
Yes. Yeah. So what do you think of translation number one? Best. <laughs> It doesn't make sense, right? And translation number two? And three? Machine, yes. It's it's the h how do you think the comparison between number one and number three go? I mean at least can can you can you understand what's happening in number three? Yeah. So that's that is actually Google so the first one is Google Translate two thousand ten. It was gibberish. I mean, it doesn't make sense. You don't understand what's going on. In 2017, it's not perfect. It's not a human translation, but at least if I have this Russian text, I can actually understand it. And I think that's pretty impressive. And I, I took this translation, these two, these two from a, an article in the New York Times from 2010, and back then they were comparing in different languages. So we have Russian, Spanish, French, Arabic, and uh, the 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 French and the Spanish translation improved but the improvement in Russian is is impressive I mean given that it's a completely different language from English in order to for you to appreciate it even more even more <laughs> I have another example which this time has the uh, it's Danish I think it's not Norwegian or at least Dano Norwegian so this is from uh, Epson's uh, adults house the play and you can for those who don't read Norwegian, you can also still read these two translations and try to say for, for yourself or just which which one is, is the better translation. And for those who read trans translation, it would be, uh, read Norwegian, sorry, it would be uh, more interesting, I think. So which one is the machine translation in this uh, in these two translations yeah yeah the first translation any other opinions oh interesting so now we can't tell actually I have I, I I've shown this example to other people and they thought that number one is uh, the human translation it's actually true it's number one is the machine translation and this is I mean the not only is it's actually it's it's a faithful translation as far as I can understand the text the original text this translation number one is a faithful translation you don't miss anything w by faithful I mean it's it reflects the the information that were conveyed in the original text uh, which which is quite amazing actually to to see that you can now I mean, it's still not perfect, but to have arrived at this stage, this is what, how you can feel the progress in the field, and this is this uh, uh, this this new improvement in Google Translate is actually very very recent. So in 2016, this they they deployed this new uh, neural network based machine translation in which they cut 60% of their error, so that's quite an improvement. And uh, they used deep learning techniques and etc. And I, this is this is uh, when I when I have a star at the slides, this means that there is a link. So this is an article, uh, an interesting read for the weekend or from the New York Times magazine. Also, uh, it, it tells the story of how Google actually and or a group of researchers and engineers at Google came together to make this small team, which eventually led to this huge improvement. Um, but since I so I'm mentioning deep learning and uh, sort of neural networks, and these are pretty much you know very much in fashion, very hot topics, and this leads me to actually talk about what we call uh, the hype cycles or uh, and AI winters. So uh, AI as a field has been subject to several hype or to cycles of hype or hype cycles, and which led to AI winters. 
So what we mean by a hype cycle is that you have a, a technological, uh, say, uh, discovery or new, new technology that is not very well understood, but it seems to be very powerful. So you have a v extremely high expectations of what's, what's going to happen. But people haven't yet understood all the, uh, like the, the problems involved around the, 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 the issues that this technology might solve. So you have extremely high expectations. Uh, I can actually draw a figure. I'm not sure if you will, all of you s see it. So it will be so. Now we have we have uh, neural networks, and these are the our expectations going up. And then at some point, we get a dose of reality, and we realize that actually it's not that simple. It's not that easy. So the expectations go down, really, really down, and then. I mean, some 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 theories say that with time, uh, can you see it there? S with time, uh, people start to understand more, and you have this natural improvement of things. And uh, so AI has been uh, subject to to many uh, hype cycles. So people are really excited. I mean, you you re you look at the news today, and it's full of articles about how AI can do, and about Facebook making robots that talks in a secret language, which is just an exaggeration from media etc so anyway we can take an example really interesting example in the in the 60s that was the first ai winter the late 60s so the first episode in this winter was uh, a rep uh, a something uh, a report called uh, language and machines so uh, just a historical perspective so the work on machine translation started in uh, in the 50s during the cold war the U.S. government wanted to know what's happening in, in Russia. They wanted a uh, more efficient translation of Russian documents. And, of course, the Soviet Union wanted the same. So they started this research and funding on uh, machine translation. And then in 1966, the U.S. Uh, National Research Council hired an advisory committee to look into the advancement and progress made in uh, machine translation. And the report was very negative, extremely negative, which led in 1966 to a complete cut of funding in machine translation research uh, which means less less interest and less uh, resources to work with this uh, and then the second episode was this uh, book by Minsky, Marvin Minsky and Papert uh, it's called Perceptrons and this book uh, they explained the limitations of neural networks at the time neural networks were this you know a uh, silver bullet that can, sol ca can solve anything. So, and that that was what people believed, and, and it, it can represent any problem. And any problem can be solved in neural networks. But then, uh, Minsky and Pepper they showed mathematically that this is actually not true, and it, it's it's limited, which led to even more cuts and 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 funding to research. One thing I actually find very interesting to <laughs> look at. Do you know this Google Ngram uh, viewer? It's it's interesting to s to bring it up because it's it's an application with an LP and also it's something to actually uh, show you here. So I'm gonna write machine translation, and uh, what what Google Ngram uh, books Ngram uh, does is that it's uh, uh, between uh, they the Google has digitized the books between uh, or the books they had access to not the books uh, between 1800 and uh, 2008. So you can search in all of these books using this uh, interface, and you can see the frequency of words uh, occurring over time and th the frequency of the use of some word. So if we write machine translation and we look, uh, let me make this case insensitive. And if we just consider the American English, I think is uh, better. So uh, this is the timeline. So here, down here, you have the years. And you see this here, this uh, spike in interest and then extreme uh, fall. That's actually 1965, 1964. And then it goes down because people were disappointed and there was nothing to talk about anymore. So it's really interesting to see this and actually reflected in books and, and research literature and everywhere. And you see uh, a similar, actually, there is a similar uh, also hype here and then going down again. I think this is related also to this fifth generation computers that were they were trying to make in Japan. They put a lot of money in it. They wanted to make these computers that can speak to people, use human language, etc. And it was a big failure. So again, you had this 
uh, huge drop. But I think this is quite telling of what's happening uh, in a sense. And I mean, this is just until 2008. So I guess if you continue, then you will see now again another uh, sort of spike. And this graph might it might be that it will continue actually to grow up. We don't know, but it's 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 a reoccurring thing in the field to actually have high expectations and then be disappointed. So now we are currently, as I said, we are currently in this in one of these in the, in the midst of one of these hypes, and there are <laughs> even doomsday prophecies that this is going be to be the end of our civilization, and uh, we are. So I'm, I'm going. So there is a lot of attention here in, in the media in general and about the existential risk of AI. So it's it's actually it has a risk that uh, uh, it might lead to our end as a civilization. So a prominent name like Steph Stephen Hawking actually said in, in 2014 that it's tempting to dismiss the notion of highly intelligent machines as science fiction, but this would be a mistake and potentially our worst mistake in history. So highly intelligent machines are what we sometimes also call uh, super intelligent machines. These are the machines that are more intelligent than humans. That's why they're called super intelligent. They can uh, maintain themselves they can do things that are not meant they are not meant to do they were not programmed to do that's that's the idea so and then you have another name like elon musk who's uh, saying again he, he he's he's quite uh, vocal on this topic uh, saying that with ai we're summoning the demon there are many contradicting views here and i i'm not going to take anyone any any view here on this topic so it's it's you can research it more uh, i think it's interesting to read about it but uh, it might be a little bit exaggerated, it might be too far-fetched, I don't know. Uh, as a result of this, there is there are uh, institutes now to regulate, to push for more regulations of AI. This is one of them, the Future of Life Institute. Uh, it's more nuanced in a way, so for example, this open letter in 2015 uh, basically said that the progress in AI research makes it timely to focus on to focus research not only on making AI more capable, but also on maximizing the societal benefit of AI. And that was signed by hundreds and thousands of researchers, professors, uh, technicians, etc. So like people like Musk, Norvig, Peter Mo Norvig is, and Russell, these two are the authors of the Artificial Intelligence Modern Approach book, and Peter Norvig is the director of research at Google. You have uh, Mitchell, Tom Mitchell, very important name in machine learning, uh, Wozniak is a co-founder of Apple, so really important names saying that we should also focus our uh, research on uh, things that are beneficial to societies, not only just advancing the technology to uh, gain ma more profit and etc. From my point of view, I think it's it's actually more interesting to look at concrete threats that are already existing today and not sort of looking in the future. This is uh, a hypothetical experimental thought, uh, what are called a uh, thought experiment, and it's usually provoked in the ethic ethics course. So you probably have seen it before, and it's sometimes brought up when you uh, talk about self-driving cars. Uh, again, it's in my opinion, it's not the biggest threat, but it's something that I will <laughs> explain to you. So this trolley problem says that. Assume that you have this runaway trolley, no one can control it, it's going straight onto this uh, railway track and it's going to hit and kill these five people who are tied up. And you are right there, standing by next to this handle and you can pull it and you can then shift the, tra uh, the railway to go to this uh, track here and kill only one person. What do you do? And this is a really an ethical question, I mean there is no right and wrong here and it depends on what what you think what you believe uh, is is the best is it better to save five lives is do we quantify things etc and people sometimes bring up this this uh, problem with the machine with the self driving car who is going to decide if there is a self driving car uh, how is it going to decide what's what's what what to do the, and who encodes this uh, sort of uh, uh, ethical answer here in the because you can you can program the self-driving car to do something that causes less harm in terms of numbers, but then it's you as a human as a maker of this machine is 
taking this decision so it's it's a it's an interesting question i think more relevant questions could be about the societal uh, impact of self-driving cars on on economy on jobs etc all of these are relevant things we're not going to talk about them very very often in our or actually we're not going to talk about them after today but i think it's very important to to be aware that they exist and you need to think about them another one which i think is even more scary in my opinion is this uh, this piece of news that i read just re very recently from the intercept uh, the ICE is the U.S. Uh, Immigration and Customs uh, Enforcement Agency from the from the uh, Homeland Security, and they had this event, one day event or two day event, in uh, somewhere in Virginia, and they invited tech technologies to help them build a system that implements Trump's extreme vetting, and the system, according to the description from the uh, ICE. The system must determine and evaluate an applicant's probability of being a positively contributing member of society as well as their ability to contribute to national interest and it should predict whether an applicant intends to commit criminal or terrorist acts after entering the United States. Now when you work with NLP and AI, you know that these programs are actually far from perfect and you cannot account for all different scenarios. But now we're suddenly delegating this responsibility of decide, deciding who's going to be a contributing member, of whatever that, is, that means, and who is to going to be a criminal to the machine. And this is, I mean, the system here will build on information that is already gathered by the Homeland Security, but also build on everything that is in the public domain, meaning Twitter, Facebook, blogs, all like Google reviews you, ha you have written, a anything that's on the public domain is a fair game to them. So I think that's pretty scary to have this uh, view that we can actually let machines decide who is good and who is bad for some definition and good and bad. I think it's, it, it is something that we should really think about. Another interesting article, again, I, I'm just, uh, these stars is readings for you to procrastinate, to have fun, whatever. Uh, the rise of uh, the weaponized uh, AI propaganda machine is also a very interesting read. Again, it's, it's not a scientific read, it's just a, 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 an investigation of this company called Cambridge Analytica, which helped Donald Trump actually win the elections. It's, it's, ba it's, it's directed at what they call uh, behavioral change. So they collect information about you, it's, it's a huge question about privacy, but they, they're not only interested in sentiment analysis, which we will talk about later, they want to change your behavior. So that's also another uh, scary part about, uh, or not scary, but uh, a threat that we need to consider in a more, uh, it's a more realistic threat that we need to consider than the existential threat, I think, at least in my opinion. But anyway, after this whole <laughs> long introduction, and I think for us in this course, the ethical questions are also, of course, important, but for us, AI is going to be this, this bag of, of tools uh, that we're going to use to represent problems and solve them. So, and uh, our focus will be on human language. So our problems are related to human language. That's why the course is called Artificial Intelligence, uh, Algorithms for Artificial Intelligence and Natural Language Processing, because our, actu our focus is actually uh, natural language processing uh, using artificial intelligence techniques. So I think the course is, I mean, it's mostly not your language processing, because natural language processing is actually including, it's, it's a subfield of, of not including, it's a subfield of artificial intelligence. But anyway, so AI for us is these techniques, algorithms, models, representation of, of uh, problems and problem solving. So now the next question is, what, what do we mean by uh, natural language processing, when we say natural language processing. Uh, one definition could be making computers understand the human language. So, and again, we have this understand in quotes because we don't want to have, I mean, there is no definition of what do we mean by understand. This translation is actually uh, from, from Russian to English understanding the language, or just transferring it. What matters to us is that we want to make the computers 
do things that are related, not really, not necessarily understand, but are related to human language. So machine translation, voice recognition, uh, search, Google search is an example of, of uh, natural language processing. And the field itself is, is uh, sometimes called language technology, like, like the name of our research group, language technology group. It's also sometimes called computational linguistics. Uh, it's uh, it's a, a, like AI, of course, it's a young field. So it's, it's been around since the probably the 50s. Uh, and it's interdisciplinary because when we say making computers understand the human language, we are talking about computer science and linguistics. So we want to understand computer science because we are making computers understand. But in order for us to make them understand, uh, to make computers understand a human language, we need to understand the human language also. And the field to understand the human language is linguistics. So we borrow from linguistics a little. I mean, in this course, there isn't really much. But the the field in general, we you you actually need to understand some s linguistics to be able to achieve the the goals that we have in natural language processing. But we also borrow from other fields. So uh, cognitive science is the science of studying the mind and how we think. Uh, we borrow from statistics, uh, information theory, and machine learning. I mean, these are. The, the also the not, not only natural language processing and AI in general, we borrow from these fields. And the same can be said about uh, natural language processing. Uh, so some applications, I mean, I should have asked you before, but anyway, you have now the set. So you use, actually, you use natural language processing applications in your, in your uh, daily lives. So on your mobile phones, when you start typing, assuming, so on, on at least on smart smart mobile phones, you have this, uh, spell check and you have the grammar check and you have the autocomplete and prediction so you start typing and uh, the you, you get a suggestion on on the current word you're typing and on the next word that you might be uh, or you w we might want to write so uh, and that's actually one thing that we will learn I mean we will learn the basics to do this in the course like how how you actually build the language model that predicts what could be the next word that I'm going to say? So that's one. I mean, it's we're not going to build a, predic a, a predictive keyboard, <laughs> just to to make sure you you don't have high expectations. And uh, the, we we we're going to build the language model, which is basically a model that tell, tells me if I say now the word eat, what's the probability to say the next word being school or the next word being apple? And it's high. The probability is I'm, I'm going to say apple is higher, of course. So something like this. Machine translation is, you already know this, you're already familiar with this, we talked about it. Question and answering systems are, these are the systems that, uh, you, where you, you, you have you a question either written or uh, you utter a question, you say it, and you get an answer for that specific question. It's different from uh, uh, internet search because there we are just looking for, key, uh, you, you write keywords and you get results. Whereas in question answering, you are actually interested in a fact or in something you want to know specifically. You don't want a set of millions of pages to actually go through. You just want the answer to your question. Uh, dialect system, I think uh, these, these applications you, you, you know by now, Siri, Amazon Echo, or Alexa, I think it's called Google Now, and apparently there's something for Microsoft called Cortana, and I, I didn't know about it. And these, these four applications are examples of both dialect systems and question answering systems. So you, you, you pick up your phone, you say something, and you get uh, an answer for your question. But there is also there is some, some level of uh, dialogue system. I mean, it's, it's not a full dialogue system. It's asking for more information. But it's still, uh, we, can, we can call it like that. And what's going on also, wha this is speech recognition. So when you say things, uh, Google Now or Siri will recognize what you said and that's what we say what we call speech recognition so that's also another uh, application yeah it's a it's a long list so uh, sentiment analysis for example uh, you have uh, uh, something like uh, for example say a uh, Apple wants to introduce a new product to the market and they want to know how people feel about it. So they choose the region in the world and they introduce this, this product and then they start collecting reviews 
uh, of on, on, on websites, but also on Twitter, etc. And then they start to analyze these reviews or feedbacks and uh, do sentiment analysis, how satisfied or dissatisfied the customers were with our product. And this could be done with political parties, as, as I talked about that political uh, candidates uh, in Norwegian elections could actually see how the Norwegian public is responding to their uh, uh, performance in debates, etc., by looking by doing sentiment analysis on, on information that is in the public domain. Can you think of any other applications that I actually failed to say? Or like, did you do you when you when you registered for the course? Did you realize that you were using these natural language processing applications? No. It's a yeah, it's uh, it's challenging to make the class very interactive. I don't know how to do it, but uh, it's like Stefan is better in doing this than me. Anyway, so uh, before the break, let's. This is the last uh, sort of or a last try to actually say what is AI. So uh, this is from 1997. A quote again from the New York Times, and the quote goes as follows: "Speak English to your computer. Press the button." and have your voice come out speaking French in science fiction, not a problem. In reality, or in the real world, not a chance. Well, here's how you do it. This is what, now you can do it in Google Translate, right? So what was perceived as science fiction exactly 20 years ago is something we do today. I mean, you can, you can do this simultaneous uh, bilingual conversation on your phone, and it sort of works. I mean, again, it's not perfect, but 20 years ago, it was actually science fiction. So AI could be thought of as this, this thing that we cannot achieve. It's science fiction, but then we manage to achieve it, and then we think of, you know, of a larger thing that we want to achieve, and that becomes AI, and et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, uh, have, have you tried this before? Have any of you tried this before? It's, it's entertaining. <laughs> more than useful <laughs> it's, it's entertaining it's, uh, you, you should give it a try okay i think we can stop here for now or let me yeah we can stop here for now and uh, yeah come back at quarter past let's continue uh, yeah so before the break we talked what's about our try to define what's NLP through applications and definitions. And uh, like in AI, we have also ethical considerations in NLP and natural language processing. So this might be a bit uh, challenging to explain. So uh, in NLP, there is this thing called, uh, or a technology or whatever model called word embeddings. So we'll learn about it or things related to it. So word embedding is, for now, think about it as a black box. Uh, you, you have as an input millions and millions of words or sentences written by humans. And the output could be uh, how similar are two words. Or, but it's also used in applications uh, like uh, what we call uh, analogy. So if I tell you that uh, Oslo is to Norway like Stockholm is to, what would you say? Sweden, exactly. So you have th this is the analogy, right? And you can use these models to do the same. So you know that there is a capital relation. And unfortunately, what happened in this research study in 2016, uh, a word embedding model was trained on human language, and it was asked a man to a uh, is to a c computer programmer as woman is to a homemaker. That was the output of the uh, model. Homemaker is is a house husband, housewife in this case. So what we are doing is actually we are reinforcing our uh, bias, our discrimination and sexism into this uh, into this model. Um, it's 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 unintentional, but that's what's happening. So I wasn't aware of this until I think a year ago or so. So uh, less than a year ago. So this is something that is actually. It goes without talking about it in, in the field, but I think it's very important. And maybe when we talk about word embeddings, we might actually end up uh, teaching word embeddings, or we'll have a guest lecturer who'll give you a, a lecture about word embeddings based on vector space models. 
then maybe then you can go back and read this interesting article. Uh, it's a scientific article about debiasing word embeddings. So how do you actually uh, change this, these word embeddings so that a word like an, a gender neutral word like receptionist or a nurse shouldn't be uh, to the model a, a more similar word to female than male. But that's what's happening. To the model, receptionist is more similar to female than male because of, of what kind of implicit uh, biases we already have in our language. So that's one, one example. And then there are other things related to uh, the use, for example, of uh, the Amazon Turk. I don't know if you have heard about it. It's this service where you can hire people to do annotation for you online and they like the, you give them the bare minimum of money. So you just put your task on Amazon and people from around the world will, will come and do the task for you. So the output would be an annotation you can use in your, uh, in your research. And there has been a lot of criticism to the service because it might include uh, child labor, it c might include people being paid really, really uh, small amounts of money, uh, exploited basically. So these are things that again we're not going to talk about but really, really relevant to what we are doing. So what makes NLP hard? Why are we really impressed by Google when it's actually translating and why it took that long for it to do some translation and uh, why is it still not perfect? What's the problem with language? So we have this sentence here. We saw her duck. It has at least two interpretations. Uh, can you give? Yeah. Yeah. So did you hear it? So either she owns a duck or she is uh, actually ducking. So meaning that she's doing like this. So to verb, and, and there is maybe another interpretation. Yeah, exactly, the saw you saw from, the, but that's a very unlikely interpretation, I guess. So you have these two, right? So you have, uh, we saw her own duck and we saw her while she ducks. And what's, uh, this, 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 pic these two, this picture is actually from uh, a trivia, actually. It's just uh, a side note. This is from a film in the 50s it was uh, it was called uh, duck and cover and it was screened in schools in the US to actually teach uh, students how to uh, do personal protection against nuclear nuclear threats so this is a personal protection technique i think it's very relevant donald trump is in office you need to know this just take it anyway so uh, why is there is ambiguity in this sentence first of all you have duck here which could be a noun or a verb so what's happening, and this, this is an ambiguous sentence, one element in the sentence is duck could be uh, a, a noun or a verb, and her could be uh, the object of she, like the object pronoun of she, so I saw her, and it's, it's called, it, it also could be the uh, possessive, so her own. So. so these different interpretations of the words are what we call ambiguity. And ambiguity is, is actually, it's a property of human language. So it's something that, uh, as, as a feature in human language, is something that we use and uh, uh, on on different levels. So different linguistic uh, descriptions that we call them here are associated with ambiguities, meaning that words are ambiguous, sentences are ambiguous, uh, the utterances that I say could be ambiguous. So ambiguity is a central feature in human language. Uh, someone like Noam Chomsky would say uh, ambiguity is actually uh, a proof that human language is not perfect, is constructed, etc. It's, uh, it's uh, an uh, imperfect system. Others would say from a cognitive si science point, point of view that ambiguity is actually good because for us to disambiguate short words, easy words, is easier than to learn very long words and different words uh, to refer to different concepts. So ambiguity for us is a feature, at least we can actually handle it with, with context as w and with background knowledge. So if we have the same background knowledge and uh, you have the context, you can actually disambiguate and know the meaning of the word. But this amazing feature in language is actually a problem for NLP. For the machine, it's a problem. Because how do you disambiguate? And you can 
you can more or less, I mean, not all NLP problems are disambiguation problems, but many of them are disambiguation. So disambiguation problem or disambiguation itself is a central problem in NLP. And we can, most of our uh, problems that we're going to learn about can be described as a disambiguation I problem and which lead us to a search problem. So a search problem is that you have different candidates and you're searching a space of these candidates to find the best one. So different meanings of duck and you find you want to find the best uh, meaning that fits the context. So let's take a closer look at what's what are ambiguities in, in language. So and the word Norwegian, uh, the Norwegian word rat here uh, has different meanings. Those who speak Norwegian can help me here. I am not that good anyway. Court and right. Straight. Meal. When netting, okay, that's uh, justice. So court. Justice, uh, meal, oh, what else did you say? Correct, correct yes, correct. <laughs> uh, so uh, many, many meanings really. Fair, justice, uh, right, correct, so uh, that is right. It's also great, right? Uh, so how do you disambiguate? How do you know which, which one of these is actually what we mean by right? And the ambiguity here is happening on two levels. So you have ambiguity in meaning mean like what is the actual meaning of red when we say it and what's its part of speech and what what we mean by a part of speech is it's what we call lexical category meaning that uh, the part of speech of a word could be a noun a verb an adjective uh, uh, an adverb so you learned this in school probably you didn't, probably you called them part of speech probably not but this is what they are called so this classification of the types of words into nouns verbs etc so red could be a noun and it could be an adjective, at least uh, as far as I know. So in order to uh, un understand what, what is the meaning of red, you need a context, right? So this in this different context, red has different meanings. So in a sentence uh, like this, kunden har altid red, which means the uh, customer has uh, is always right. So this is here in, in the sense that it is right. But when you say en daily red, then you're talking about a delicious uh, meal or dish. So with context, we as humans are able to uh, disambiguate with machine. That's what we will try also to do, to rely on context to disambiguate. So, and this is what I, uh, maybe I didn't mention. This is what we call lexical ambiguity or world wo word level ambiguity. So this is this ambiguity is only, we're, such this, we're just looking at word. We haven't actually moved forward yet. So if we move a bit forward and we see something like a sentence like the authorities jailed the protesters because they advocated revolution. And another sentence, the authorities jailed the protesters because they feared revolution. They here could refer to two things. Could could be referring to the protesters and the authorities. And in the different sentence in the two sentences, the uh, what we interpret as uh, who is who are they uh, differs based on how we finish the sentence. So, when we say the authorities jailed the protesters because they advocated revolution, it is more likely that they means the protesters. I mean, given our knowledge of the world, at least it's more likely. The authorities will not uh, jail protesters because the authorities themselves advocated revolution. And uh, the other way around, it's the authorities jailed the protesters because they feared revolution, they feared revolution here they is referring to the authorities because the authorities are the ones who fear the revolution at least in this context so this is what we call referen referen referential ambiguity so this pronoun and other pronouns we use them as a way as a shorthand to express things that we have mentioned before and we can easily interpret them or at least very naturally as humans but this is a really difficult problem for nlp to solve so you are analyzing the sentence. How do you, how do you actually, how how do you draw the the link? Which which one of these are actually the they? So referential ambiguity. Then we have uh, sentence level ambiguity. So or structural ambiguity. That's an example by Stefan. So I like eating sushi with tuna, and I like eating sushi with sticks or chopsticks. So 
here uh, the structural or what we call propositional phrase attachment in, in, in the syntactic analysis uh, how do we so are we eating sushi with tuna like together with tuna or also are we eating sushi with sticks meaning that we are using sticks we're not so the with in this case in the first case is, is sushi with tuna but then the second case it's eating with sticks you see the difference so that's also another level of ambiguity. How do you attach this this the small preposition and it's uh, what comes next is what we call prepositional phrase. How do you attach it? Do you attach it to the noun or to the verb? And again here given the context it's more likely that you will be eating with sticks. You won't be eating the sushi with sticks as an eating sticks. It's you will use you're using the sticks to you, to eat. So again context is what's helping us here. We know that humans are less likely to eat sticks, or at least, again, uh, that's our shared knowledge. Uh, uh, we can assume it. And then we have this acoustic uh, ambiguity or like the speech recognition ambiguity. So I s if I say she studies morphosyntax, which one I said now? Which one of these two sentences? She studies morphosyntax. Can you tell? It's 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 so it's more likely that she I'm I'm actually saying morphosyntax, which is the study of morphology plus syntax, because morphosyntax is a bit offensive to those who study syntax. So uh, we'll, we're gonna say she studies morphosyntax. So, uh, but you can think of many other examples, and this is what we call speech recognition. Again, you have no problem, and at least. Uh, to some extent, in, in understanding what I say, uh, the computer will have a bigger problem. An NLP application to recognize speech uh, is going to be is going to require more knowledge. So, uh, again, very quick historical background of the uh, field of NLP, which also actually is. AI. So what I said here is also applicable to AI. What I will say here is applicable to AI. So uh, generally, we can distinguish between two approaches when we work with NLP problems. You have the rationalist, uh, rationalist approach and the empirical approach. In the rationalist approach, what we are saying is that we need to sit down and write handcrafted formal rules and manually enco encode knowledge. So meaning that we know that language is uh, a system of rules. There are rules for this language that works according to predefined rules we, we all know, otherwise we wouldn't understand each other. So we should write these rules in a formal way according to some linguistic theory and then encode this knowledge in the computer. So that's the rationalist approach. And then you have the empirical approach which says we can actually uh, uh, learn these rules using statistical patterns in, uh, from from uh, from data. So it doesn't matter how uh, it doesn't matter that we actually write these rules or not. As long as we have text and annotated text, we can actually learn the rules using statistical methods, uh, machine translation, uh, ma machine learning methods. Sorry. So in the from the 50s until the 80s, most of the or the dom the dominant approach was uh, the rule based one. So most uh, applications would be would include people who are familiar with linguistics uh, sitting together with people who are working with computer science and trying to write rules and uh, writing rules for translation, for example. And, and I think in the 70s or 80s, there was this also another hype article about uh, machine translation being a solved problem again in the New York Times. And uh, they were saying the power of parse, because now we have the rules to parse and we know how to parse, then it's a solved problem because we sat down and written the rules to parse. It turned out it's actually very difficult to write these rules and it's not that simple. There are many exceptions, etc., and it wasn't a solved problem. Anyway, so in the 80s, uh, an empirical system that does speech recognition outperformed the rule-based system. And that was the tipping point to move from rule-based system to uh, a, a empirical system. So basically what happened is that uh, there were uh, uh, or there, there is a set of speech signals so assume our like our lectures here so are recorded and then you have transcripts of these lectures so strings written written version of what, what we are saying and then someone sat down 
and said that this speech signal refers to this sentence and this word refers to this exact uh, speech signal. So you had this parallel uh, data set of speech signals and words, uh, written words, and you had a machine learning uh, or, or an empirical, uh, emp uh, empirical system that learned from the transcripts uh, that are available and the speech signals and could predict uh, when, 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 when um, given a new speech signal, it, it managed to predict the, uh, the actual string of words. So speech recognition is basically transforming speech signals into written words. That's what we mean by speech recognition. So this achievement, which was actually, uh, again, it's very important to put things into perspective. What happened here is that it outperformed another system in a very narrow and domain-specific uh, way. So the, the speech recognition was not open. It was not Siri or Google Now. It was a very specific uh, application for a limited domain. And uh, there were ru uh, some, some conditions on how you can, how, uh, the, the quality of the voice recorded and that it, was o it worked only for one person, not all people unlike Google today. Uh, so uh, anyway, that was the start for the push towards more and more interest in, in, in the empirical approach. So 90s, everyone was moving towards the empirical approach. And then in the uh, in the 2000, uh, these two approaches were no longer seen as opposing poles. They were no longer seen as uh, I am e either following the rationalist approach or the empirical approach. They were seen as a complementary approach. But I, st I, I, I do think that the, or as actually the fact that the empirical approach is still the dominant in the field, especially today. So uh, people still use uh, handmade or handcrafted rules and formalisms and etc. But they uh, mainly rely on data. So using machine learning, statistical techniques, learn patterns from data rather than uh, write rules. So if we go back to the example of machine translation, the way l you learn machine translation is that you have, you don't sit down and say that if you see this translated to that, and if you see uh, a, a, a a negation in in, uh, in French, for example, this is how you transform it to English. What you have is uh, thousands of documents or millions of documents written in different languages in the same document. So, if you take, for example, the European Parliament, their their sessions are translated into the languages of the European Union. So, you already have this data and you use it to learn how to translate. So you have the same, the exact same thing set written in French and in English. Probably not, no English anymore after the UK, but anyway, English and Spanish, uh, sorry, Spanish and French. So you have that parallel text and then you learn from it how to translate. This is a statistical method. Uh, yeah, so this, these empirical methods or empirical uh, techniques are studied in uh, a field called machine tr uh, machine learning. So that's uh, what we call it in computer science. Machine, uh, what we call in computer science machine learning is called statistical learning theory in in mathematics. So, but it is this uh, uh, as defined by Tom Mitchell, who is one of the uh, also important names in machine learning. It's the study of computer algor algorithms that improve automatically through experience. So, what does what 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 it means really is that with more data, more and more data, more and more uh, text showing you how to translate, you will the, your algorithm will improve. That's, that's what it means. So you are given examples and you make predictions about new things from these examples, based on these examples. We will learn more about this. So machine learning is part of our course. It's the techniques we use in our course. Uh, and 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 machine learning of course itself is not limited to nlp so it's applied in many different uh, fields uh, what they are they are called data intensive sciences meaning that they rely a lot on data something like biology or robotics biology and gene uh, learning how the genes works for example that's they use a lot of machine translate uh, machine learning uh, robotics uh, signal processing uh, computer vision for example face detections, etc. All of these uh, fields are using machine learning. There are a lot of methods. Uh, it's no, so you've probably heard of some of them. You probably have used some of them before. 
We're not going to cover all of them, of course. What we're going to do is we're going to select select a few methods, uh, and we apply them on uh, a selection of problems again relating to human language. And the way we select the the uh, machine learning uh, techniques that we're going to look at is by uh, having like sort of a flow of of uh, information that so we build on the things that we learn in the fourth lecture and the fifth lecture etc so the selection of techniques is uh, sort of restricted in that somehow uh, okay so that was nlp ai uh, machine learning now our course also has a practical side or like a programming aspect of it so all the obligatory assignments uh, are to be programmed in lisp which is a, a a programming language some of you might actually know it how how many of you did like took the uh, 28 something functional programming course oh wow. that's uh, yeah so some of you already are familiar with uh, functional programming but it doesn't matter lisp is different i mean it's it's, it's somehow similar to scheme but it's, there are many also differences so for those who have don't know it's actually it, it will be the same so no one has an advantage over anyone a anyway so lisp is this powerful high level language with long traditions it's uh, it is started this lisp uh, language is started as a uh, a, a mathematical formalism by John McCarthy, the guy who coined the term uh, AI. Uh, he wanted to have a mathematical formalism to work on something, and then he came up with Lisp as uh, as an as the mathematical formalism Lisp. But then one of his students, uh, Steve Russell, implemented an interpreter for this mathematical. Uh, formalism so that it became a programming language that we use today so it has been around since the uh, since 1958 and it's yeah as, as written here it's a functional programming uh, language some people say that it's the AI language it's it's uh, I mean at at one point between the 50s maybe in the 80s the late 50s and late 80s it was the AI uh, programming language many programs for AI were programmed in, 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 in Lisp but no I, I don't think it's it's fair to say it's an AI language just an AI language it's a it's it's a programming language that is used in many different situations not necessarily only with AI uh, some people I well like, I, I haven't taught this course for a long but uh, time but the last year so the feedback was from the students is that why are we learning this language it's it's an old language it's an outdated language no one needs it anymore uh, that is not completely true because it's actually not an outdated language uh, there are many dialects of Lisp that are still used uh, today uh, like Clojure for example I, I was I was working in a private company in 2013 or 14 and I was using actually Clojure it's a uh, it's uh, it's it runs on the java virtual machine and we had to use it for some application so it is actually in use uh it's it had these features that uh current programming languages are actually borrowing from so for example you have this uh, lambda functions or the autonomous functions that were anonymous functions uh, that were introduced in lisp in 1958 but java 8 uh, implemented them like a couple of years ago I think so it's it's something that is uh, even though it is it's it's not uh, on the sort of top priority for people to program with it's actually a very interesting language to learn here is an article about this website called Grammarly which is it's an interesting website because it's an application of NLP again it's this website that does grammar correction and it's actually running Lisp in production. It's it's using Lisp to uh, to run the website that is doing grammar uh, correction for. If you have a long document, you want to do proper grammar correction, not just uh, 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 spelling correction. So grammar correction is different from spelling correction. Uh, then yeah, you I, I haven't tried the website myself, but uh, it's it's an interesting read. Another thing that I actually came across a couple of days ago. There is this uh, analytics company in, in Spain, and they're struggling to hire people who know Lisp. They have openings in Marbella, 
So maybe you can actually move there and work with Lisp. They want people who work with Lisp. So it is actually relevant. It's it's not irrelevant. I think so. We will uh, be using uh, Common Lisp, which is a dialect of Lisp. Uh, there are many different dialects of Lisp. Common Lisp is one of them. It's a fully standardized uh, uh, dialect of Lisp. It has many uh, built-in data types. I think this is will be this will be different for those who work with Scheme, and uh, it will be it is easy to learn, uh, and it's uh, uh, we will use the next two weeks. So Stefan will be teaching the next two weeks. He will give you a crash course into to to Lisp. Uh, you will have a chance to work with uh, Lisp also in in, in the oblig uh, in the lab uh, the lab sessions. Uh, but it's it's yeah it's you shouldn't you shouldn't think of it as an obstacle for you to continue this course it's it's an easy language to learn and you will have fun and uh, this is this is one of the few chances that you will get to actually learn this language and it's functional programming for those who haven't done it before it's actually a new way of thinking compared to other uh, programming ones. but anyway our course is not about programming so this is just a tool uh, another thing that we recommend uh, is to use Lisp or common list together with this text editor that I told you about Emacs uh, so Emacs is a text editor in, in Linux but I think there is also a version in Windows it's it's a powerful editor because it allows you to do uh, many things which I actually have never done with it but anyway it's a powerful editor uh, it's uh, it is actually the advantage of Emacs is that it's so easy to integrate with Lisp and it will be easy for you to write your assignments with Emacs and Lisp. It will be a seamless integration, so you will compile and uh, interpret your code in the same editor. So that's that's an advantage, I think. And it's uh, it's a bit hard to get used to the key bindings in the beginning, so it takes some uh, getting used to. But then it's once you once you know how to work with it, it's uh, it will pay off. There is no requirement actually. You, c you don't need to use it. It's it's just a way for us to make this uh, uh, to make a sort of a, a comprehensive package of tools for you to start working with the assignment. But if you if you manage to link uh, the the Lisp interpreter compiler with some other text editor, of course that's that's more than more than uh, welcome to do. And uh, yeah, I think uh, yeah. And once you start playing with uh, I'll I'll write somewhere where you can actually uh, pr uh, talk to this Emacs doctor so you can talk to the Emacs doctor if you're having problems with it it's it's a fun thing to try okay so now we go, go to s let's let's have a closer overlook of what we're going to do over the course of this uh, of this term so first as I said we'll have two lectures uh, about how to use Lisp basic concepts and uh, will equip you with everything you need to solve the obligatory assignments. Uh, then the first mm, lecture relating to NLP will be about something called vector space models. It's a, uh, it's a model to represent meaning among other things but we will use it to represent meaning, word meaning, semantics. It's a non-probabilistic model at least in the way we will use it meaning that it's it's, we will not employ probability theory yet in that. Uh, is, uh, this, is, this is the model that if you learn about, you will, be easy, you will be able to understand word embeddings. So after this, I haven't put it in the slides here, so after this lecture we might have a le another one on, uh, on word embeddings. We'll see how we, we will fit it. But anyway, these are the fixed uh, topics so then we'll move from vector space models we use what we learn in vector space models to learn how to do classification uh, classification is something like a very simple example is the spam folder in your email so whenever you get an email it's automatically classified into spam and non-spam generally so uh, this is what we call classification as given an email how, wh what is the class of this email is it spam or not and that's what we're going. Not we're not going to work with uh, spam uh, filtering, but other applications. But that's classification. It's called supervised learning, uh, and we are going to use techniques that uh, use vector space models to do classifications. So that's where we build on. Uh, 
the previous knowledge we have, and then we will do clustering. Clustering is what we call unsupervised learning. So uh, clustering very, also very, very quickly. It's this uh, technique to group things that belong together in, 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 uh, in different groups. Uh, but you don't actually have formal knowledge, you don't have labels on them. So if you have a huge set of documents and no one told you what's the topic of these uh, of the, those documents, this is you, you don't have any, any information, you can actually do clustering. So you can group the documents that look similar together in one group and then you look at them manually and say, okay, this is the group of documents that is about politics, etc., etc. Again, so we'll do some clustering. Uh, and then we will do language models. This is a probabilistic machine learning model. So we will, before we start with language models, we will learn about, uh, we will review or do a quick review of uh, basics and probability theory. Nothing, nothing really difficult. Uh, these language models are the things that I told you uh, about. This empowers the predictions on your, on your phones. So. Uh, with the language model, you can predict what is the more likely or the most likely word that I'm going to say next, or character, etc. And then we will uh, do hidden Markov models, which are this is what we call sequence classification. So in hidden Markov model, the application will be parts of speech tagging. So given a sentence uh, in English, we want to uh, predict the uh, sequence of parts of speech. Uh, for that that is the, the most likely for the current sentence again more on this when we uh, when we are there statistical parsing that's the last topic it's what we call structured prediction so how do you build a, uh, a, a structured uh, representation of a sentence so parsing is this uh, creation of uh, syntactic trees for sentences or it could be dependency graphs so uh, what is the verb and what's uh, what's the uh, subject and the object of that verb and how they what's their relation to each other? If you remember the example of I uh, I like eating sushi with tuna. That's what that's or with chopsticks. How you uh, the you solve the ambiguity in in statistical parsing. So all over the course we will have topics uh, or themes that are occurring over and over, which is machine learning. Again, it's our tool to solve these problems. Uh, we will work with uh, scalable data representation. I think that's a, one of the important things about this course is, or the interesting thing is that you, on the, uh, the obligatory assignments, you work with data that is used in research. So you work with uh, real world problems in a sense. So uh, millions of words to tag, or thousands of uh, sentences to parse. Uh, we don't just give you like a simple example and you try and uh, see if your program works. You, ha you have to make your program works on uh, a sizable uh, large data of uh, text, w uh, sentences, etc. Which, which it's not challenging. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm actually telling you that it's, uh, it is good to actually learn this because then uh, you will be able to continue with research or real life uh, tasks and in, in industry and then we will also will ha will have yeah we'll will have a look also at dynamic programming this is a technique that also use in decoding and encoding uh, with we do we use it with headed markov models that's where we i think maybe most of you have seen this page that's where we will publish the uh, schedule so uh, and we will have the the uh, the required readings here on this for each lecture. You will have, you will see what are the required readings, and uh, you will have a link to the slides and a link to the uh, recording of the lecture, which we will put on YouTube, a screencast. I, I I assume many most of you know how to go this. So if you go to the N forty eight twenty page and then. Uh, it's on under schedule. That's where you see it. Uh, we will have, yeah, as as you know, ready. We'll have two hours uh, of lectures every week. It's going to be Stefan and me lecturing. Uh, we will have two lab sessions uh, or two hour lab sessions weekly. Also, there are two groups, uh, but both of them are on Thursday. Uh, we will, yeah, I said this also, we have a YouTube channel in case you miss 
a uh, lecture or you really like a lecture and you want to listen to it again you can go there uh, yeah that's a very quick uh, over or it's a high level view of where the course uh, stands in comparison to these three uh, sort of keywords if you want so 4820 is the intersection of statistics meaning using machine learning uh, statistical methods to solve search problems so this ambiguation search problem uh, and we have we focus on implementation because we want to implement uh, a, a programs that run uh, in a real world or at least a, in, in, in a sizable data set so implementation is actually one part so we want we are interested in, in what data uh, what uh, data structures we use to represent things etc this sentence uh, I think is not easy to read but uh, so what we will want to do is efficient and scalable algorithms and data structures for searching probabilistically weighted solution spaces yeah uh, now we come to uh, even more uh, important details uh, so uh, there will be a written exam of course by the end of, uh, of the semester in order to qualify for the exam, you have to pass or succeed in, in, in all the obligatory exercises. There are three exercises, but two of them are split into two parts. So in total, you have five problem sets. So you will have to submit five assignments. But the way they are organized is as follows. So uh, you have exercise A. Uh, sorry, exercise one, which is one problem set. And then you have exercise two, which is two problem sets, A and B. And then you have exercise three, which is also two problem sets, A and B. And in order to qualify for the exam, you have to uh, get on exercise one six points out of ten. Th it's not a pass or fail. There is a minimum score that you, you need to, to get in, in, in the assignment. In exercise two, the full exercise, meaning 2A and 2B, you need 12 out of 20. So on 2A there will be 10 points, on 2B there will be 10 points. It doesn't matter whether you get 10 on A and 2 on B. That what matters is that in total you should get 12 out of 20. And uh, the same is on exercise 3. So you have 3A, 3B. Your total should be 12 out of 20. Uh, we don't allow resubmissions in this course so you cannot resubmit a, an assignment the way for you to make up for uh, uh, for some reason you you didn't manage to do well on 2a is to put extra work in 2b and the reason we don't put allow resubmissions is because it's as i said this two is exercise two is two problem sets but it's in general it's one so it's they build on each other so 2b builds on 2a and what we normally do is that when once the uh, due day uh, due time for the assignment has passed we publish a model solution a solution that we believe is a good solution for you to start uh, with 2b so we cannot delay this publication of model solutions until a resubmission uh, for of for some students of course in case of illness that is guaranteed, you, you are guaranteed an extension, but then we'll find a way to work around this. But otherwise, there is no, no resubmission. Uh, I will update this page. So again, there is a page that shows you the, the same things that I've just said uh, about the obligatory exercises, how, how is the point distribution works, and uh, we'll have out and due dates for each of these, uh, of, the three, of the five problem sets so that you can plan for for the full semester. Uh, I'm running out of time. Okay, so our reading list is uh, selections of chapters. And oh, oops, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. It's, uh, it's, uh, it should be out next week. So I think you might come to the lecture and it would be already out. And then you would have two weeks to submit it. But I'll, I'll update this before the end of this week so you'll have a clear plan for the the uh, the uh, syllabus or the reading list for us is are the from three books uh, two of them are so Seibel and Manning and others the information retrieval are available online so you can you don't need to buy them the first one Jersky or Martin that's a the textbook in NLP this one is not available online we will be reading parts of them of course we'll select 
chapters and sometimes even just sections and have them as required readings. So uh, you will need, I think, this book anyway because it's not available online, so you need to buy it. It should be available in the uh, bookstore at uh, Blinn. Uh, the other two are available online, so if you you don't need to buy them. So you can just uh, pick an online uh, check the online copies. There are also other... Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll have to jump over this. So there are suggestions for recommended readings. Uh, the readings are actually, just to say this, the readings, when, when we have them on the web page, it's actually very important for you to read them. Try to read them before the class. It will be much more beneficial. Sometimes when the topics become more a bit more advanced, we would have to skip over things so or say it in a way that you probably find difficult or so it will help you uh, so when you have questions we have this piazza online discussion forum we have a link to this discussion forum on on the course web page uh, if you are, since i mean uh, it's we we encourage you to sub to write your questions on this discussion board and we encourage you to actually answer each other's questions that will allow, like, you know, just just have a place where you all can interact and talk, and it will be easier for us. So if we get the same question over and over on email, then uh, we'll have to write the same answer over and over. So it, it's helpful if we have the discussion most of the time on Piazza, but you can also send an email to the course staff uh, using this mailing list address. You just send an email to n4820-help at ify.ui.no, and then it will reach the course staff. Uh, for, yeah, uh, uh, August will be the teaching assistant. Uh, Chao will be the course assistant. Uh, she will be just grading. August will be teaching in, in the lab session. So you can, of course, send us send an email individually to any of us, but again, you're guaranteed to get a quicker answer if you send it to the list. Then all of us will get the uh, your question or request, and one of us will answer. Uh, important it's very important that you check your email of course i mean <laughs> goes without saying uh, uh check the course web page so that's where we will actually uh where is it just a second oops uh we'll we will have messages for you here on the home page so we'll publish messages on when like the due dates for the uh, assignments etc if we have extra suggested readings it's things like that and uh yeah participate in Piazza. I mean, we, we are out of time, but if you have any question, mm, please feel free to come and talk to me. Thank you.